Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Convenience Marketing Group podcast. I'm here today with Luke Maurer. He will introduce himself in just a second. But as, uh, as I always tell the listeners, the Convenience Marketing Group is here and we're focused primarily on owners and CEOs of convenience stores, convenience store chains, convenience store distributors, and also people that make stuff, manufacturers for the convenience store space. And the Convenience Marketing Group's help, we help people drive new sales, higher gross margins, and we do that all with differentiated marketing. So you can find us at conveniencemarketing.net. I'm your host today. My name is Tim Lazar, and I'm the um, the president of the Convenience Marketing Group. Okay, let's get started. I have Luke Maurer here. Luke uh, brings a unique perspective to this podcast today for two reasons. And the main topic of this podcast today, it has to do with cars. And cars is something that we assume naturally in the convenience store space that you have primarily have to have a car to get onto the lot of a convenience store. So Luke uh, is uh, involved with two companies, his family's business, uh, BJ Maurer Ford, and also a company that's unique called Ad Giraffe. So Luke, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tim. Thanks okay. for having me. Good. You Audio is okay there? Yep. Sounds good. Wonderful. So let's break this down. I mean, introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about BJ Maurer Ford. And then what I'm kind of interested in is this one, two punch is add giraffe and then what you do there. So tell us a little bit about BJ Maurer Ford. Perfect. So my name's Luke Maurer. Um, I'm fourth generation here at our family Ford dealership. And it all started back in 1924, whenever my great grandpa started the Ford dealership here in Boswell, Pennsylvania. Right. Um, it's a super small town. Um, and he started the dealership right after he got done fighting in World War I. So he fought in World War I, went on a cross-country road trip in a Ford Model T with his brother, and they got back uh, from their road trip. And he figured, I want to start my own Ford garage. So he started it, ran it for a while, went through many ups and downs, um, went through the Great Depression there towards 1928, 1929, 1930, the Great Depression time. And it was it, he was struggling and he couldn't really keep the business going. It was tough. His customers couldn't really afford to, to pay for their vehicles or to get them fixed. So what he did was a lot of his customers were farmers. So he would have his customers bring in sacks of potatoes and, and different types of crops that they would grow and they would pay him, my great grandpa, in the crops and potatoes, corn, things like that in order to keep their vehicle and to get their vehicle fixed. And then that would allow my great grandpa to feed his employees and his family and keep things going. And they're just little stories like that, um, that each person has to tell. So my great grandpa, my grandpa, and then my dad especially has a bunch of stories like that. What he had to do to keep it, keep it going. And I always admired that about my, my mom and my dad, how they pushed through and kept the business going. And I knew from right then and there, I wanted to be a businessman too. Yeah. So, and I love the car business. So um, what I do now is I have ad giraffe. So I started a digital marketing and a software company about two and a half years ago. And we really like working with car dealers. That's kind of our bread and butter space. Um, so you, you're basically a digital marketing firm that is primarily focused on the business that you know best, which is the car dealership business. Yep. Exactly. That's our main focus is the car okay. dealership space. Okay. So, and how is that going for you? It's going great. Um, we learned ways to leverage the internet and marketing our brand and our business and the store behind our business, just like that story that I told you about how my great grandpa started it and went through the whole entire process to keep the business floating. We kind of take that mindset and that storytelling approach to right. the ads that we put out there for our customers and our growing fan base. And it's just a great way to communicate our message. And we kind of attack it in a different way than a lot of other dealerships do in the area so okay so as i mentioned at the top of this luke i mean cars are an integral part of the convenience store business you've just got to have a card mostly to get to a convenience store more and more and more today uh and we hear a lot of talk in the convenience store space and i wondered from your point of view from a car dealership perspective i mean there's been a big 
I don't want to call it a debate, but it's uh, there's a great concern. Maybe that's the be best way to put it. That if electronic vehicles come onto the scene in the convenience store space, that you know those people that are currently driving up to the pump aren't going to need gasoline anymore because they're going to have a, an electronic vehicle. And there's then there's also some of that discussion around well, should there be charging units at convenience stores. That's a big expense for a lot of convenience stores, whether they're a single store owner, an independent or a chain. So everybody's kind of, do they need to get into that space? What, you know, if you were kind of looking down the road here, uh, you know, and around the corner in the next one or two years, what are you seeing from a car, from, you know, a guy that's running a car dealership when it comes to electronic vehicles versus gasoline powered vehicles? So that's a good question. Um, a lot of dealers in our area are, are wondering that same thing. What's going to happen whenever this whole EV movement is starting to take off a little bit more here in this area? And uh, there's different programs that different manufacturers um, and the dealers have to buy into to in order to get their their dealership location approved to serve the EV market. So right. we have to put in charging stations as well. And it's just, it's really, really crazy. It's going to change everything. It's going to change the way that we do a service business um, and the shop. Cause now we're not going to, there's not that combustion motor anymore that we are so used to repairing and fixing. And it's just going to be a huge, huge change. Um, but what I, I think I'm missing one of the parts of your question. Can you say, say that again? Well, as you say, if you look around, the, you know, when it goes to looking around the corner, you know, seeing around the corner with electronic vehicles, I wanted to see, I mean, I didn't really think of that as far as repairs and being, you know, trained to do electronic vehicle repairs at a dealership. Um, you know, my, you know, based on my research, the numbers show there might be somewhere between 1.7, 2 million electronic vehicles in America right now. A lot of those are in California, and I mean, it's certainly a lot of convenience stores in California, but there's a lot across the rest of the country, too. Um, but as far as electronic vehicles, do you have any numbers that that either square up to that or, don't, or aren't square with that number and that percentage of, of electronic vehicles in America? Yeah, so I think definitely out west in california the electric vehicle numbers are a lot higher than they are here in western pennsylvania right um i know in new york city there's a higher number of electric vehicles and then down towards like washington dc so north south and west of us are some cities where there's bigger concentrations of these um electric vehicles but not really in our area yet mm -hmm. and i mean i kind of think it might be unpractical to have an electric vehicle in our area just because there's so many hills um farmland you have to travel a long way to get to your work or visit your family and your friends and things like that so i don't really see that electric vehicles could be as practical here as they may be in a huge city like los angeles or new york city or washington dc um, got it so. Okay. And you you bring this unique perspective being a young guy and, you know, you come from this, you know, started in what, 1924 car dealership. Yeah. And, but, you know, as you went off to college and, you know, were obviously intimately involved with the car dealership. I mean, you developed this passion for digital and social marketing. So you're, you're unique in that you combine those two kind of talents and skills. But I, and as we had talked earlier, you know, one of the things about uh, car dealerships is that is hardcore retail marketing. I mean, you've got to engage people. So much of it is competing, you know, on price. You don't want to always be competing on price, uh, but, but you are. So when it, so let's kind of switch over and, and talk a little bit about AdDraft as a digital marketing firm. And, and I want to do this in two ways. One is talk about car dealerships. And then I want to transition over to some of your ideas and thinking as it applies to the convenience store space. I mean, there may be convenience stores out there, uh, the owners of those chains or those independents or whatever that are starting to say, you know, I want to get into telling my story a little bit more uh, deeply and more aggressively, but they don't know how to do it. But I want to start with what you do for your with Ad Giraffe and what it does. For, like, how do you drive 
engagement? How do you drive people onto your lot through Ad Giraffe and get them onto the lot at BJ Mauer? Great, great question. Um, so what we do at Ad Giraffe, we do a few different things, but number one, what we really, really do is we track everything so that whenever we sign up a new dealer, we can show the dealer how many people see the ad that we create for the dealership. And we like to create ads that gets customers attention, um, ads that resonate with the person who's on the other end of their iPhone or their Android scrolling through Facebook or Instagram. And then if they see an ad from a local dealer that compels them to stop scrolling, read it and click on the ad and then give that dealership their first name, last name, phone number and email address. And then maybe answer a few questions about what they're looking for um, maybe how long have they been looking? What stage are they in? Are they ready to buy now? Are they just looking? Um, and then once we get them to submit that form, then right here is where a lot of the magic happens because that lead already was submitted to the dealership. So the dealer has that lead. They know that John Smith is looking for a new truck. He's been looking for a long time and he's ready to buy ASAP. So now once you get that information, it's the dealer's responsibility to follow up with that lead, get in contact with them in a quality manner or a, a, a fast enough time, which is what we do. So at Giraffe, we also have a business development center too that works with our dealers. Um, so, because all these leads that we help dealers generate, it can be really hard to follow up with the leads in a timely manner and right. communicate effectively and efficiently. So we kind of take that workload off of our dealers. We do it for them. We text them within 60 seconds of them submitting the lead, give them a phone call and we shoot them an email. And then this is where it gets really, really important. So it comes down to how do we communicate with the customer? The customer probably doesn't want to get bombarded with a thousand phone calls over the course of five or 10 days. They're probably going to want to text or they might want to email, but text messaging is huge. Right. And in the car space, so many dealers aren't really texting um, the best way they can all, most dealers can have a better text messaging, messaging strategy than what they have now. So text message is huge. And right there is where you find out some, some crucial information from that customer. So you might ask John Smith, Hey, is it, is it okay if I text you or would you rather have a phone call? John Smith's probably going to respond with, Hey, Mr. Dealer, I'd love to just text, just text me. Don't call me. So then there is where we have the conversation of, okay, well, hey, great. I see you've been looking for three months. Is that true? Okay. Hey, why haven't you bought yet? Uh, where are you from? What do you do for work? Hey, now that I know you a little bit, now can we jump on a phone call, get a little bit more intimate and ask some, some deeper probing questions that we need to know in order to make a car deal happen. And that's kind of, that's what we do. We, we get the person to interact with an ad. They click it, submit the form, then we warm that lead up, find more out about them. And our main goal is to warm that customer up and get them scheduled on the calendar for an appointment to come into the dealership and talk one-to-one -one with a sales representative or the sales manager about a vehicle that they might be interested in or you know, just take a look at all the vehicles on the lot. So, so it, it sounds like you're when people get engaged with an ad that you serve on Facebook or some other digital or social media, that your marketing at that point starts to happen in real time with them, right? There's not, it's just, it's not passive. It then kind of the baton gets handed off in a sense and it becomes very active. Is that an accurate description of that? Now, yes. So that's the one, that's the one section of it. So yeah, we collect the lead and then we follow up with them via phone call, email, and text. But the beauty behind what we do, since we're an advertising agency, we love data. So we love taking that information. We love taking those people who've engaged with our ads and we love serving them multiple ads now on Facebook and Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat, whatever. So once we have people who engage with us, we like to put them in a separate group, a separate audience, and continue showing them ads from our dealership. Maybe, hey, we know you already engaged with us before on Facebook. Did you know that we offer lifetime free state inspections? We offer free oil changes. We offer an, an extra set of keys. We offer a full tank of gas whenever you purchase from us. 
And then if they continue to engage with us, we now have them on an email list. So they're going to start getting emails that are catered to them. Maybe someone filled out a lead and said they were interested in a truck. They're going to start getting emails that has information on all of our new trucks that we have or all of our pre-owned trucks that we have on our lot. What are the benefits of getting a truck versus a car or an SUV? You know, different things like that. So we can cater to different people who interact with our ads, with our brand. And it just kind of, it makes people connect with us a little bit better and our clients a little bit better if they're getting served information that's relevant to them. When you serve people ads after I engage with you, let's say on Facebook, and I, I give you a little, uh, just a little bit of data and engage with you, and then you re- re- retarget me in a sense on different platforms, what is, what is that called and how, how does that work behind the scenes? I'm curious. Yep. So we call that retargeting or okay. remark- remarketing, whatever you would want. Um, but the way that it worked is, so our bread and butter platforms right now, where our clients are getting the most bang for their buck, are on Facebook and on Instagram. So- okay, now let me stop you there. So one of the big pushbacks you'll, you'll hear from, at least I do sometimes from clients, is, oh, come on, Facebook. That's just a bunch of women posting their pictures on Facebook. Yep. So push back on that. Tell me, tell me why Facebook is, uh, you know, for a guy. Because remember now, the, the old target audience in... Uh, in the convenience store space was always, you know, Bubba, men 18 to 40, 49, uh, Cokes and smokes. That was the old model. Now that model has changed. And certainly that, that, that blue collar, brown collar woman is certainly in the convenience store space, cares about a clean restroom and safety and lighting and all that stuff. Okay. But so tell me why Facebook is robust for buying a car. So, Yeah, that's a good question too. So um, Facebook has over 2 billion monthly active users. So that's, that's huge. That alone should tell you something. And the tech and the minds that are behind Facebook are, they've already thought about everything. So they, they, they're able to calculate all the data, all the interactions that their users have, which is, which makes it such a valuable platform for us business owners to make ads on there and pay Facebook our money to take advantage of all of their data that they collect. And you can reach anyone on there. Um, I know people fill out our lead forms all the time for our car dealer clients. And, you know, it might say Mary Jane is the name of the lead, but then whenever we call Mary Jane, he'll answer the phone and he'll say, Hey, we'll say, Hey, is this Mary Jane? And then he'll say, no, 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 this is John. This is John. Mary's my wife. And, and we're like, oh, okay. And the reason why that happens is, is because John, for, for some reason or another, is on his wife's phone. And whenever he, he might just look on Facebook as like a news source, or he maybe he wants to go look for pictures of his grandkids and he knows that his wife has a Facebook account. So he goes onto her phone. And he's scrolling through there looking for his grandkids or whatever other pictures he wants. And he sees an ad from a car dealership. And whenever he clicks it, the, the form auto-populates with the, the owner of the Facebook account, which is his wife. So it auto-populates with Mary Jane. And then he might answer the questions, but he probably doesn't realize that it says Mary Jane. So just so many people use Facebook, people you would never, never even understand. It's crazy. Wow. Okay. And, you know, one of the things, uh, I don't know if you had mentioned this, there's a book by Russell Brunson. uh, I think it's Russell Brunson. And he talks about how robust of a search engine things like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter are. And I'll give you an example is, you know, my wife uh, had suffered with shingles and I had just searched on Facebook for shingles support groups. And a bunch of them pop up and just people that give you ideas, information, support, insight, things like that. So, I mean, you you can basically create and or find a tribe of people that have similar interests or problems that that you have. Uh, Is that what you find in Facebook as well? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. You can find a group for anything you want. It's awesome. So for car dealers, for example, you can join different what's going on in, in that county. And you, you, there's groups for what's happening in the county. People might post, hey, I'm selling my 1924, or my 1930 Model T or Model A or whatever it is. 
dealers can go on there and they can buy it. They can find cars like that. They can also post pictures of their vehicles on there and, and people will buy it from there as well. So Facebook's just such a great tool. You don't have to, to really put money behind ad campaigns to get the benefits from it. But right, so right. many people on there, they might just create a Facebook account just to join a group like that, like support for, for shingles and things like that. It's, it's really, really cool. And a lot of magical things can happen inside of those groups on Facebook. Right. So let's shift gears just for a second here. I want to pick your brains a little bit in terms of the convenience store space. And one of the things that you and I had chatted about earlier was <clears throat> the convenience store space has not been, generally speaking, sophisticated when it comes to, you know, being retail marketing, retail merchants. Um, in general, some of the bigger players are, are, are better at it, but in general, they're not really sophisticated marketers. So one of the, one of the jokes that, you know, I, you and I sh had shared earlier is it seems like that the, a lot of the convenience stores would take that two for price promotion, you know, two, two candy bars for a price or two Gatorades or something for $3 or $4. And what used to be, you know, maybe a pump topper at the store and used to be a, a door sign at the convenience store, that thinking, that quote unquote marketing thinking, and I'm just calling it more price item that's driven by more by the manufacturer of the, of like M&M Mars or of Gatorade or, or Nestle or somebody, the manufacturers drive a lot of that thinking inside the convenience store. It's, it's almost by default, right? So I'm buying all that product and then the, the, the pricing or the promotion comes down from the manufacturer. It doesn't have to be that way, but by default it is. And um, so what I've seen happen is we've just basically transferred that thinking from being something that's printed on a pump topper or on a door sign or inside the store. And it's now just been transferred over to the world of, of social and digital media. So if you look on convenience store uh, that have a Facebook presence, as an example, they just, they'll have the, the two Gatorades for a price. And you know, in the in the in the competitive space of the convenience stores, that's no longer going to cut it. You have to be much more strategic and differentiated if you're going to survive. If you think you're going to sell cokes and smokes, and and again, as we had talked earlier, just rely on gasoline, maybe, maybe not. All of a sudden, your business model is not creating enough value for that convenience store customer, or more importantly, that new convenience store customer, whoever that potential person might be. So <clears throat> what I wanted to kind of throw out to you was if, and this is that what if magic, what if question, if, if Luke Maurer grew up in the convenience store business and started ad giraffe, uh, but you were, you know, intimate, like you are with the car dealership, if you had to start to transfer your digital and social marketing skills over to the convenience store space, and let's say that you knew that it was, you know, the, the primary audience, the easy one is men 18 to 49, but you now want to do, you now wanted to, uh, attract women, you know, let's say 25 to 60 as a demo, as a target audience. So very female, because maybe your convenience store had particular products that appealed, or you wanted to get from the manufacturer products that were very female oriented, right? Into your convenience store. You wanted to grow your customer counts. So if I challenged, if I was a convenience store owner and I said, Luke, I want to add draft to find me, you know, m more women, 25 to 60 years old. And I've got two products, you know, one is a, a salad product in my store or maybe a, a lower calorie breakfast drink for women. How would you go about starting to attract those women and in a hardcore retail way, get them onto my lot trying my products versus my competitor right across the street, right? It's adjacent yep. catty corner to me. So how does Ad Giraffe start to find those women and get them inside your convenience store, or at least in this case, my convenience store? Yeah, this is really cool. And I love thinking of things like this. I love placing myself in a situation and thinking, what would I do if, if, if I grew up in a convenience store and here I am 25 years old, I'm, I'm running a marketing company. If, if I wanted to push a certain product or I had something really, really good, I believed in an offer that I had to get it in front of a female audience between the ages of 25 and whatever you said, I, I can't remember the age gap. 60, there. yeah. 60, 25 and 60. 
there's a few different things that just come to mind right off the top of my head. Um, so number one, if I had a convenience store, I would want to communicate to my customers and I would want to build an email list and constantly just get to know my customers, just like in the car dealership. All of our customers know my face. All of our customers know the faces of our salespeople and of our service manager, our parts manager, our sales manager, everyone, because we're so active on Facebook, we're active on our email campaigns, everything. So what I would do is I would craft um, some sort of ad and maybe it would be a picture of the salad, like shaking or just something of the salad looking really good. Maybe a picture of a drink and the top three things on it. Maybe, hey, this is less than X amount of calories, um, organically grown or whatever. I'd have some right. things there to kind of catch that target audience's um, attention. So as they're scrolling through Facebook or Instagram, they'll be scrolling through, Oh, like that salad looks really good. They might stop scrolling and they might see Mauer convenience store has this product that they're offering. And I might show this to people just in my general area. So maybe I would know, okay, 90% of our customers are from our surrounding area. We don't have too many people who drive through from outside the area. So let's get this ad. Let's put it in front of people who are living in a certain radius of our convenience store. And I would have that ad and I would have a few other ads that I would use for retargeting after someone engages with that first ad. So I'd have this ad, I'd show it and I would maybe in the ad copy in the words above it, I might say, if you're interested in this or if you would like to try this power fit meal or something like that, if you would want to try it, give us your email address and you automatically get X amount off or you get a free protein smoothie or something like that with right. your coupon. And I would do that. I would get a ton of email addresses. And after I have a ton of email addresses every single day, I'd be getting emails from people who see the ad. So I would be growing an email list of women who are fitting that description. I now have their email and that is so valuable. So as soon as they click submit, and they get that coupon, they, I would then have an email automation campaign set up that automatically is being sent to all of these females who are filling out their email address and interested in that lunch that we have to offer them. So the first email might say, hey, Jenny, thank you so much for uh, checking out our PowerFit meal and, our, and you are able to win a PowerFit smoothie now or you get one 50% off with your meal. Here's what this meal offers. X amount of calories, which results in more energy, uh, you know, and whatever else, just to kind of get them drawn in. And they're going to continue to get those emails depending on what actions they do. Maybe if they go to the store and they turn in their coupon, maybe the person at the cash register or whatever, they can scan the coupon and maybe that could then trigger another email. It says, hey, thanks so much. Uh, you just bought your first PowerFit meal you now get whatever percent off on your next one. And then right. you can continue marketing to those people with email saying, hey, you like this, maybe you'll like that. Or you tried this, maybe you'll love this. Different things like that. And it's just that that's how you get to know your customers and that's how your customers get to know you. Maybe I throw a picture of my face in there, <laughs> resonate with the brand, like, hey, right. I love that you love our meal. Like, you know, and just different things like that. Just get fun with it, be creative. But I would absolutely do it. And then on the back end too, for everyone who sees that ad, that original ad that says, Hey, try this salad and this shake or whatever for lunch. Um, for all of the people who see the ad, but maybe they don't give us their email address. I'm going to start to retarget them maybe with a video. So maybe tomorrow or the next day, they're going to see a video of me or someone making a salad, whipping it up or, or something, just a different image, and they're going to be seeing that again and again and again until they click on it and they give us their email address. And now we're going to market to them forever until they tell us to stop. So just, there's two things I, I, I want to get clarification on. So if I engage, if I see an ad on Facebook from Mauer's convenience store and I engage with it, but I don't give you my email address and I don't give you my phone number or anything like that, you can still retarget me. Is that correct? Yes, I can still retarget you. I can, I, I can how, does that, audience. how does that happen? So, and this is why we're an advertising agency too, is because we're nerds. We love learning the ins and outs of, of the actual advertising backend platform that 
that different social media companies have to offer. So for example, in the ads manager, which is Facebook's backend, where you set up all the ads, all the targeting, um, everything, I can make a whole new ad and I can say, okay, show this ad to all of the people who have engaged with our Facebook page in the last five days or the last one day or everyone who engaged with this post, let's send them this ad. Or you could say, okay, Facebook, show this post, show this ad to everyone who has watched 50% or more of my last video that I uploaded. So it's just a really good way to, you know, get your ads in front of the right people that you really want to see what you have to offer. Right. And the other thing that you said that I, I wanted to go back and, and circle on it was, it sounded to me like you have the ability if you're a, and this is important for C-store owners, if they have a single store location or with if they have 10 stores, 20, 100 stores, it doesn't matter, you know, depending on, on their demographics, you know, if you have a single store, typically that business, unless it's really unique, that, that, that target group of people that shops at that convenience store probably comes within five miles of the, the physical store, you know, the brick and mortar store location. And you're saying that through your Facebook ads, and I, I'm asking also if this is not only true for Facebook, but an Instagram or a Twitter and, and a TikTok or whatever, that I'm able to draw a circle around my store within five miles, 10 miles, whatever I want to do. And I'm only going to talk to communicate with and engage with those people that are within my, not only within my geographic area, but then I can drill down to the women 25 to 60 within a five mile radius of my store. Am I, am I hearing you right? Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. So you can make a radius around your store. It has to be five miles um, or it, it can be as small as five miles. It used to be one, but Facebook changed a few different things up. So mm -hmm. you can now go within a five mile radius of your location and you can target people who, who Facebook recognizes as lives in this area, or you can target people who Facebook recognizes as people who are passing through this area. So maybe if I was a convenience store owner and maybe my my store is located right next to a huge ski resort, which Seven Springs, Laurel Mountain, Hidden Valley are all right here, I might put ads going out to all of those different locations, people who are passing through and people who are living around the area. And I might have an offer like, hey, here's our skiers package or here's why I, X amount of skiers passing through the Laurel Highlands loves this package that we, we sell here at Mowers convenience store. And then we can continue to retarget to them and, you know, just different things like that. It's, it's really, really cool. The things that you can do. Right. And it's not expensive either. So putting together one of these campaigns, it, it's so cost effective and so many people will know who you are and what you offer from, just making a good campaign like that. Yeah, one of the other things that we have been engaged with over the, in the past is you can uh, geofence a, like a billboard. So you can have your message on a billboard for Mauer's convenience store. And you can also, within geofencing that billboard, serve up an ad to maybe the family that's on their way to a Seven Springs or whatever. Talk a little bit about geofencing to our target, to our, to our listeners. And w like, what is geofencing and how do you use it? Yeah, so geofencing is a really cool thing. Um, and we used to do that a lot um, with a lot of our car dealer clients because they would be right next to maybe competitors. So we would put a <laughs> geofence around their competitors a lot. And we would um, exclude people who worked in the car business. So it, it, it wouldn't be showing to the employees of that, that dealership. So people who drove within a one mile radius of that dealership's lot we would then start serving ads to them of our offer or our, our client's offer. So it's just a really cool way to, to capture people and serve ads to people who are in a certain area. It's, it's really, really cool. You know, one of the other things you talked about, uh, as far as, you know, you can engage people and retarget them, even if they don't give you a text or an email address, phone number, whatever. But one of the things that convenience store owners, I think there's a gap is they don't have a lot of data on their customers. I mean, a lot of times when I talk to them, 
they just don't have a real good feel of the percentage of men, women, age groups, demographics, zip codes, where their customers come from. They've never done that kind of research. Can you use Facebook to collect, collect data, uh, incentivize people to give you data, not necessarily to offer them, you know, to serve up an ad, but to do a research project. And, and if I want to understand like, I, Hey, I, you know, I have a convenience store or I'm going to open a new convenience store at this specific location before I do that. Can I also do some research via Facebook or put a program together where I can have the data prove out, collect that data and prove out like, you know what, this would be a good location for my next convenience store. Is that something that, that a Facebook kind of initiative could do? Yeah. So Facebook, I know a lot of their privacy settings have changed within the last couple of months and it's, it's kind of been changing a lot. So I'm not even really sure what's all up to date and what's not, but I know that in the past, and you still might be able to do that, do it, but in the past, you could actually go onto your analytic side of Facebook and you could see ne like necessarily how old your, the people were who were looking at certain products or engaging with certain posts and things like that. And it would also tell you what their gender was, were they male or female between this age what city are they from percentage wise? And they could really break it down. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you would want to start from, say you had nothing, say there was no such thing as Facebook analytics, which I think it's actually not even around anymore, but say you wanted to, to do something on your own to get your own data, you could run an ad on Facebook and it would be under your C store um, business page on Facebook. And, and the ad might say something like, Hey, answer five questions and receive a free $5 gift card to ABC C store or something like that. So whenever people see the ad, they're going to say, Oh, okay. Hey, I get, I get free five bucks to this convenience store that I pass by once a month. I, I get a, I get five bucks for free if I click on this ad. So they click on it. And then there's five questions that they can answer. Like right. how often do you stop at ABC C store? Um, how far do you live from ABC C store? what's your favorite product at ABCC store, different things like that. And you can send that ad out to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. You can get hundreds and hundreds of people to click on the ad and to fill that information out. And I mean, you can also collect their name, number and email from that too, and start an, an email campaign or a text campaign to every single person to fill out your survey. You or know, you just text them a code so many things you can do. Right. So you can collect that data, which is, you know, just really, it's just everything uh, in the C-store business to understand that customer and, and, you know, sign them up with their loyalty cards and all that stuff. But, but that yeah. mechanism for collecting that data, I don't think has anybody has really taken a deep dive on it. I yeah. guess the other thing you could do is, you know, if you had, let's say you had 50 stores, but you wanted to test a new product, but you didn't want to roll it out into all 50. And I used to do this uh, when I worked on the sheets business is one of the things that you can do then is transfer that kind of that geographical uh, limit like when you're ge kind of geofencing. So if I have 50 stores, but I only want to test this product in five or 10 of them via Facebook or digital and social media, I can kind of control that. So rather than just like running a, a radio or a TV ad or something that would be inefficient and people would come into the store and say, Hey, I'm looking for that smoothie. And you say, well, I'm sorry, we don't have the smoothie in this store. You can control all that kind of scrum that might happen by controlling it with specific, you know, five or 10 location tests with a product. Is, is that, would that be something that Facebook could also do? Yeah. Yeah. You could absolutely set something up like that. You can set up a campaign, get things in front of certain people in certain areas and, and see which place it would work the best at. Okay. So I think I have maybe two more questions. The, and the first one is, if I'm a C store owner, you know, I've got a bunch of stores and I'm starting to consider you know, getting into this space, what are, what are the common mistakes that you see some, like a, a retailer that might make, and maybe you just have to use your, your car experience here, but what are some common mistakes that you would advise me to avoid uh, when I'm start like, you know, starting to get into this, this retail marketing uh, program for my convenience store? 
what are the landmines? What are the pitfalls that you would advise me to avoid? Yeah. So I, I wish I could, you know, think a little bit more in depth of how it would translate into a C store, which it might after I'm saying this about, cause I'm going to relate it all to a car dealership space. Okay. So say a new car dealership was coming in and they reached out to me for some help and they were looking at how they can market their business. What I would tell them not to do would be to just put up pictures of their cars on ads that just has the price that says, come and buy it. Here's our price because no one really cares about that. If they want, they can go on any website and look up that vehicle and compare the price for similar vehicles and just go buy the cheapest one. Um, uh, so I if I want two Gatorades for three dollars, it's the exactly exa it's the exa it's a it's it's parallel to that, right? It's like there's no thinking. It's just a price and an item, and whoever has the lowest price and who wants to enter into that game, but whoever yep. has the lowest price is going to win, right? So that's yep. a that's a common mistake that you advise people not to make. Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't advise people to do that unless you take it one step further, and maybe you have an ad of a car on Facebook or Instagram with just the price. And if someone clicks on it, once someone clicks on that ad, like maybe it was a uh, two Gatorades for four bucks. Maybe it was an ad like that. If, as soon as someone clicks on it, here's where you can kind of take the different route. Maybe you can say, Hey, not only do you get two Gatorades for four bucks, or not only do you get this F-150 for $30,000, but if you give me your name, number, and email, receive an additional $2,000 towards your down payment or receive an additional six inch sub, you know, something like that. And you, in, in exchange for that, you're getting their first name, last name, phone number, email. Now I can text message market to that person who originally opted in through a two for four Gatorade ad that I had on Facebook. Now I'm sending them text messages. I'm sending them emails. Maybe once a month, I'll send them a text that says, Hey, John, um, our deal of the month is buy one Gatorade today, get a foot long for free or buy two foot longs today, get your third foot long free or something like that. And you can just take it one step further and just take them deeper down the funnel, get them to know you and like you and trust you more and more and more after seeing that simple generic ad that so many people run. Right. So final question, if somebody's really getting uh, interested and engaged in this and they, they want to start to go down that, down, down that path, what, and I don't want to hold you to a specific uh, pricing, but what is a range? Like if I have one convenience store, I'm an independent operator and I want to start to, you know, commit to a, a year's worth of starting to put together some ads and figure out what my, you know, what my offer is, what strategically I'm going to say, that's more valuable to people other than two for, you know, a two for kind of deal of candy bars or Gatorades. How, how is this priced out? How do people, you know, so if, if people are going to do TV ads or radio ads or billboard ads, they typically know kind of what that cost is, but it's not as targeted as it seems like some of the things you can do with digital and social media. So what are some of the pricing considerations that people that, that start to factor into this? If they say, well, now I'll give you an example. A lot of times the advertising to sales ratio in so many, like the furniture business or the, the, the convenience store space, you know, it's going to, your advertising to sales ratio, let's say it's uh, in the furniture business, it'll be 6%, right? So 6% of your sales will go toward uh, the marketing program or plan. So you take revenue and you take a percentage of it. In the C-store space, when you look at inside stores, it's typically inside store sales only. So if you have center store, you have food service, you take maybe 5% of that as far as what you would commit toward uh, retail, you know, re a retail marketing pr pr program. The reason gas is excluded from calculating in that is because it's just too volatile. You know, we have gas prices that are 350, 360 right now here in, you know, the early two 2022, but then you go back a couple of years, it's a dollar less and, and the margins are so thin on gasoline as it is. You can't really factor that into your advertising to sales ratio. But having said, I say all that to ask you this question, which is what are the pricing or the cost factors that start to play into this? If somebody wants to get engaged and say, okay, I want to start a campaign. 
How much does it cost? How do you typically respond to that question for that CEO of a, of a convenience store or of a chain? Yeah, so good question. Um, and I would probably approach it the same way that I approach it with our car dealer clients. Mm -hmm. So I would probably sit down, take a good hard look and have a good discussion as to what the lifetime value is of a customer. What, what really is the value of, of the average person in your space? And I'm not sure if you have that answer for what a lifetime value is of a, of a customer at a C-store. Um, but then it, it goes to another route too. And like whenever we work with car dealers, we say, hey, we're going to charge X amount of money per month. And with that, we're going to guarantee you X amount of leads and X amount of appointments to come into your dealership. Right. And with our math, the way that we figure out is that at the end of every month, they should have five times more money in gross profit than what they paid me and my company. And that's probably, I would probably look at it a similar way with the C store. I would probably say, Hey, um, it's long-term because I mean, you make a lot more money on a car than you do on a customer who comes in once a week to fill up their tank and exactly. get a quick lunch or a quick breakfast, something like that. But I, if, for a C store, I would probably have a, a more of a long-term plan in mind that you have to stick to because you can't just, you can't implement a marketing strategy and try it for 60 or 90 days and not see a direct return on your investment and say, Hey, this, this doesn't work. You have to really be bought in and you have to do it for the long haul. You have to, you know, just, just keep doing it, putting in the effort to market your products, trust in the campaigns, um, target your customers in a different way from a different angle and, you know, see what works and whatever it does, that's what you stick with and you capitalize on and whatever doesn't work, maybe you can lean off a little bit um, and maybe eventually cut it out and allocate the funds to another section like text message marketing or something that's been proven to be profitable for a C store. Um, but that's, that's probably how I would look at it. I, I wouldn't know like an exact amount, but I would like to look at it as, all right, what's the lifetime value of a customer and, you know, how much would we have to spend to get them into the door or get a couple more sales out of that customer that they wouldn't have done if it weren't for the marketing that I have in place and that I've been doing. Yeah. And it seems to me, if you go a little further upstream, uh, because it is so measurable, you know, behind the scenes, it's so measurable in terms of who's engaging and doing what. My and and as you talk about the value that you create and how valuable that customer is to that convenience store, uh, I would think that you would probably get uh, less pushback. Uh, but that would be a kind of a vigorous discussion because there is a measurable component to it uh, in terms of who is engaging. And I think the other thing that's so neat about that is you also understand that the offer, the what you say about your convenience store chain, the story that you tell, you're able to get real-time feedback as far as how engaging that is or isn't. And then you can test your really different kind of really strategies or offers and then learn which one the a or the b or the c i guess if you want to test three which one tests best and then you can really put investment behind that one that is really resonating with those with those customers yes yes exactly and another thing too <clears throat> is that once you once you generate a lead or you get someone's email address or phone number once you pay to get that you really, you shouldn't have to really pay to get it again because now you have them and you can send them text messages and you can send them email marketing. And in each email and in each text message that you send them, you can have a strategy behind it to, to bring them back into your store, maybe exchange it for a voucher, or um, you could even in those texts and emails, you can have testimonials from customers, like say, for example, on that lunch meal for the, the females between the ages of 25 and 60, we could, if someone fills out the ad that says, hey, get your coupon by clicking this on this lunch and receive a 50% off a power shake or something like that, we can start advertising to them, um, sending them emails. And I, I just lost what I was thinking. I, I was going on a roll there. <laughs> what was I saying? 
Dang it. My, my brain literally moves. Well, we were talking about the, 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 the measurability of, you know, like you, when you talk about the value of a customer and the measurability of it, it's it, we're really just not kind of blowing smoke in a sense about, oh, just trust us, you know, we're going to do something for you. It, you know, there's real, there's real data and analytics behind the scene. Where, I mean, and that's, I think that's one of the big um, kind of points of, um, uh, you know, you're going to get, you would normally historically get some pushback because, you know, you're investing dollars into your marketing campaign. And from my point of view, you always want your marketing directly to link to sales. It, you know, you'll hear, hear things about like share of sentiment and all this other BS today. Uh, that's completely unmeasurable. Uh, I don't know what share of sentiment is, but there are people that, that, that try to try to measure it. Right. I guess it's because we can't measure, we can't measure sales or store traffic, but if you're a hardcore or retailer like you are with the with a car dealership or as convenience stores have to be today I mean they have to get new customers to survive and they have to have new offers and find different target audiences and and offer you know really convenience you know more and more convenience inside their store um, the the two fur offers aren't going to get it done anymore. So if you can find ways efficiently and and engage those people uh, with your store, you are going to you know you are going to win. You are going to create more value for people. But I think it all starts with you know these 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 social and digital and all these platforms. They're really good if number one you know how to use them and, and get customers engaged. But two, it's always I always say that what you say is always the first thing before the how you say it, right? Yep. Uh, and the how, you're very, very efficient and good at finding engaging people with the how part of it, um, finding that right message and that strategy uh, that's going to engage those customers, you know, now and in the future and create more value out of them is kind of like what we've always, all, always done here too. Um, yeah, so exactly. uh, th this has been great, Luke, and I know mm -hmm. you're on a hard stop here, but if people want to, uh, reach out to you and find out more about, uh, both, I guess, suppose your car dealership too, but more importantly, ad giraffe, how do people find you? Yeah. So you guys can find me on Facebook. Um, our Facebook name is just ad giraffe, all one word. So a D G I R A F F E. You can send me an email at Luke at addgiraffeco.com and then our website is addgiraffeco.com as well okay so. well listen i thank you for your time this has been engaging i hope we can uh, possibly pick up another topic and do it again absolutely i loved it i enjoyed it a lot thanks tim luke Maurer, thanks for your time thank you i appreciate it you bet